Bible says in verse number 17, now I declare, uh, now I, in this, I'm sorry, let me start over, get my spot here. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. Now in this, I declare unto you. It's interesting that the first 16 verses, if we just do a quick scan, verse number three, but I would have you know. Look at verse number five. But every woman, uh, um, verse number six, for if the woman... In the middle of verse six, but if it be a shame, verse number seven, for a man, uh, verse number seven, but the woman, verse number eight, but the man is not of the woman, Um, verse number 12, for as the woman, even so is the man, verse number 15, but if the woman, verse number 16, look at it, but if the man, and now verse number 17, now in this, I declare unto you. It's a very, very emphatic now. It's almost like he went through 16 chapters in 1 Corinthians to get to this now. And as you look at this chapter and you cut it in half, it doesn't seem like they're really getting rebuked for anything yet. It says that I declare unto you. It says, now in this that I declare unto you. To declare means to make clear. You only see it one other time in the New Testament. I declare unto you the gospel in verse number 15. And it says, I praise you not. There seems to be in this book of distinctions that we saw in the first 16 chapters, a hard split. In verse number two, look at what it says. Now I praise you. See that in verse number two? And if you remembered when we started this series on 1 Corinthians 11, remember we did the backstory of what's happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? And we led up to that. And then it says, Now I praise you. When we get to the Lord's Supper, though, in verse number 17. It's now I praise you not. There was a praise given, and now it's, we've got a problem. I praise you not. The problem isn't specifically stated in verse 17, but it's an emphatic now. I am declaring unto you, I praise you not. And then at the end of the verse, it says... That ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. And this is the first point I would like to make tonight is. They're not getting praise. We understand there's a problem. But they're still coming together. And that's, I think that's something we can all get a hold of. There are going to be problems. We're talking about the Corinthian church. I think every Christian would know and, and agree that this Corinthian church had problems. <laughs> Amen. It was still the church of the living God. Paul is still staying with them. Those people are still gathering. They're not quitting on each other. Are there going to be problems in every local assembly? Yes. Let's stick together. There's a time and there's a biblical way to leave a church. But as we are going to see, they have seriously messed up the Lord's Supper. And Paul is going to get on them for it. But they're still coming together. They're still coming together. Let that be a lesson in and of itself. This problem that's going to be unraveled in the next coming verses, it's not helping the gathering. It's hurting the gathering. Go to Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. I want to be a help, not a hurt. And I know you want to be a help, not a hurt. Hebrews chapter number 10, look at verse number 25. The Bible says, we all know this verse, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, 
as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. What are we called to do as believers? We're called to assemble together. Well, there's problems at this church. There's problems at that church. The church is that I understand all that. I think most Christians can understand all of that. And look, if you don't want to assemble with the brothers and sisters to which you are of the same body of, that's a problem. That's a problem. We assemble in other things, sports, music, social activities, community events, and we assemble with people that don't believe how we believe. Why? What is it about church that turns some Christians off from assembling? Is it that there's hypocrites in the church? Well, there's hypocrites at your work. Do you quit work? <laughs> there's hypocrites in the home. Do you quit being a dad? <laughs> what do you There's hypocrites within your friends. Do you quit being their friend? Why is it when we get to church, all of a sudden the rules change? I think it's because people expect the church to be different. And they're okay with their friends being hypocrites. They're, they're okay with their workmates being hypocrites. They're okay with the news media and the government. And they seem to be okay with that. But there's something about us, it doesn't sit the same way when we find out there's hypocrites in the church or something's going on or there's a problem. Paul didn't quit. He didn't want us to quit. He doesn't want us to quit. You think about being a saved Jew. You think about back in the book of Acts and you had Jews that were under the law, they're getting saved, they're coming into the church. You don't think it would be tough for them? I mean, they're used to going to synagogue. They're used to going to temple. They're used to doing things in an exact way, a specific way. And now they're called to assemble together. That's a tough pill to swallow. That's a real tough pill to swallow. Think about if you were brought up in a traditional religion, you get saved. And now as you assemble together, everything is completely different. Yeah, you're saved. Praise God. But well, now, okay, well, now baptism's different. Man, well, I guess I was doing that wrong. Now, the Lord's Supper is different. Man, I guess I was doing that wrong. Man, the, you get saved and start assembling in a church and you start growing in the Lord, you're going to find out, just like I did, we had a lot more wrong in our life than just salvation. Praise God, we got saved. But if you're going to walk the Christian walk, you're going to have to assemble together with other people that are going to do what? Well, what does it say? Verse 24 in Hebrews 10. We have to consider others. How many of you would like to be provoked to love and provoked to do good works? Does anybody here like to be provoked? Well, apparently this is a good provoking. And it happens when you assemble with others. That would be called, for all of us, conviction. You come to an assembly of believers and you're convicted to do good. You're convicted to love more. What else does it say? Uh, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another. Who wants to be exhorted? That's what happens when you assemble. So is it, I'm not saying I have the answer for this, because I believe everybody's motives and reasons are different. Is it because there's hypocrites in the church and there's no good church and I'm so spiritual I can't even find an assembly to get along with? Or is it people just have a problem with being provoked unto love and unto good works and being exhorted? I'm sure there's a multiple of reasons, but that's certainly something to think about. 
so much the more, so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Should we be assembling more as believers or less? More. This world is designed to get us to not gather together. COVID-19 hits, and now guess what gets ramped up? Stay home. Don't go to church. Wear a mask. Hide. All of that is a hiding and a retreating mentality. I'm telling you, as Christians, we need to be on the advance. <laughs> okay? We need to be assembling more. And the Lord said, the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. So you can, clo you can close and mandate all the church houses to, to shut their doors. That ain't going to stop the church. Because we're meeting in my basement. We're going to meet in your basement. We're going to find somewhere to meet like persecuted Christians have been doing for 2,000 years. You can't stop. You can't stop the gospel. You can't stop Christians assembly. You can't do it. Go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Let's look at that passage of scripture. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Let's get our spot there. Acts chapter 2, verse number 42. The Bible says, and uh, they that gladly received his word were baptized. Praise God. We did our uh, baptism last Sunday. Praise the Lord for that. And the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they, these are believers that have been baptized. You know what they did? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And in breaking of bread and in prayers and fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Look at verse 44. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. Do you pray and have your own private prayer time? Great. Continue to do that. We need it. Do you have your own personal daily Bible reading? Great. Keep doing it. You need to do it. Do you, do you have your own devotion, devotional that you do? Keep it up. But don't neglect coming together for group prayer. Don't neglect coming together so that you can continue to learn doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread. That's the Lord's Supper. All of that is important. It's not one or the other. It's not one in exclusion of the other. It is D, all of the above. That's the D where you fill in the blank. Is it A, is it B, is it C, or is it D, all of the above? All of the above. Do it all. My fear is that too many Christians in America are getting into the isolation mode. They have isolated themselves from public evangelism. They have isolated themselves from assembling together. It's not healthy. It's not healthy. Now, to qualify that, remember, I am not saying don't do your own personal daily prayer and devotion and evangelism. Do, do all that. But not at the exclusion of gathering together with a local body of believers and doing it corporately. Do it all. Do it both. But we have got to gather. We have got to assemble. And they are doing that in the Corinthian church. But it is not for the better. It is for the worse. So that's the question is, why are you coming together? The marriage vow has to do with for better or for worse, or richer or for poorer. Why? Are you getting married is what the preacher asked the new uh, the new couple that's wanting to get married. Why 
are you just coming together for better? Because I got news for you. It's going to be worse. Both. And to, and, and to hit the same nail again as a way of emphasis, they are coming together. And right now, it's for the worse. Paul's still there. Truth is still going out. It's for better. You get married, it's for better or for worse. You don't pick up and leave. You don't pack your bags and run home to mama because it's a worse time. It ain't all going to be better. There's going to be some worse times. That relationship is for better or for worse. And look, I understand there's scriptural reasons and there are biblical reasons, and there's a right way to leave a church. But what I'm talking about tonight is we need to be able to assemble and come together for better or for worse. <laughs> there's going to be some worse times. We're going to be stronger if we stick together and fight through it and work through it and pray through it and gather through it. We're not going to be stronger if we just pitch our tent and move on. Husbands and wives, they, they live in the same house. They can sleep in the same bed. They can sit at the same table and eat this and share the meal together. Yet emotionally, they can be completely divorced from one another. You know what happens in the church house? People could come together. They can sing hymns together. They can listen. They can sing the same hymns. They can listen to the same sermon. But the spirit of disunity could just be a spirit of all the people who are completely divorced emotionally from each other. They're not invested in anybody but themselves. Same thing happens in a marriage. You get more emotionally and mentally invested and selfishly invested in yourself. The emotional disconnection happens first. And the problem that we're going to see is everybody's thinking of themselves. So the people gather, but it's worse because they're spiritually disconnected. You know what? <laughs> Let's read the verse. Let's go back there again. First Corinthians 11. Now in this that I declare unto you, verse 17, I praise you not that you come together, not for the better. The better would they be edified. They'd be instructed. They'd be comforted. They would grow in grace. They would have a desire to be used more by the Lord. I hope that's your heart attitude. That's my heart attitude. That's what I want my heart attitude to be when it ain't like that. <laughs> okay? What do you desire? What do you want? Do you want it for better? Then start with you. Well, everybody else, you can't change everybody else. You can change your heart. Well, that person's mean. That person doesn't talk to me. You can't change that. You can change you. You can talk to somebody. You can smile at somebody. Verse number 18. For first of all, when you come together in the church, notice the definite article, the church. It is the one and only true church. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember in Acts 2, who added to the church? That would be the Lord. Don't get upset. Well, I invited this person to church, and then and, and, and I don't know why they left, and you got them mad. No, it's not your church. It's not my church. It's the Lord's church. He adds. Praise God that we do public evangelism. I want to do more of it. Weather's breaking. We're going to be able to be out more. There's more community events. I would love to see somebody get saved on Sunday while we're knocking doors. I would love it. But what I wouldn't love is at the end of it, we're all gathering around together, heading back to the church house, and somebody says, well, praise God, I added somebody to the church. No, you didn't. And no, I didn't. You know who added them? The Lord. It's of the Lord's church. And the Lord does the adding. Acts 5, there was obviously a reason why, but fear came upon all the church. People, for some reason, don't have a healthy fear of God anymore. 
they feel that they you know they'll they'll fear whatever the the talk radio or the or the uh the idiot box tells them but they don't fear the lord <laughs> that's the beginning of understanding that's where wisdom comes from instead of listening to the news and the government and all these worldly establishments why don't we have a healthy fear of god people locking themselves in their basement putting one two three masks on you got what is that i feel like running up to somebody and saying what are you afraid of well haven't you heard haven't you heard <laughs> don't fear somebody that can kill your body you better fear what can you you and be cast into hell remember saul he made a havoc of the church is that you god can do something mighty with your life he did so with saul and now he has a completely different view and he's trying to help them out we're told to feed the church that's the for the better part and we're going to be getting into the lord's supper and there's a physical feeding why do we come to the church that's the lord's church the church house is where we assemble we gathering together as part of his body to get fed you know what god wants the church his church wants it to be fed spiritually that's the better part for first of all verse number 18 when you come together in the church i hear that there be divisions among you and i partly believe it they're treating the lord's supper as if it were a regular meal i understand that right now we're getting fed the word of god sunday morning we're getting fed the word of god sunday evening we're getting fed the word of god the lord's supper is a different feeding it's not a regular feeding it's set apart as this is specifically what we are going to remember and how we are going to what our worship is going to be around and that's the lord it's death till he come we're remembering what he did on the cross they get into this meal it's just a regular meal to them it has absolutely no reverence to it at all paul's calling them out and all on it uh, also when you look at this in verse number 18 you see what it says i hear that there be divisions among you go back to verse number 16 remember how we finished up our series in the head coverings on verse number 16 and we and we, and we read in verse number 16 but if any man seem to be contentious we have no such custom neither the church of god now watch he tells him i declare unto you i praise you not we already talked about that you're coming together it's for the worst and then he says i hear that there be divisions he leads the whole thing up look i praise you gives him some good things there's content he talks about contention and then he hits him with here's why i'm not praising you and this is where the contention is coming from you fellas got divisions get straightened up people are in the church out uh, well i think it, it go to, go all the way back to the beginning of the go back to the beginning of the book first corinthians chapter one it's in here somewhere first uh, Corinthians chapter 1 verse number 12 now this I say that every one of you say it I am of Paul I am of Apollos and I of Cephas I'm telling you we got to get used to saying I am of Christ you know what the division is going to be and when they're getting together for the Lord's Supper you got a group of fellow you got a you got a group of guys and gals I am of Paul that's the Paul only crowd right here they're getting together having their meal you got the Apollos only crowd. Oh, hey, Apollos only. Yeah, they're all Apollos only. They're over there having their own meal. They're not going to deal with the Paul only crowd. Then you got the Cephas only crowd. <laughs> I am Cephas only. They're all back there. They're not fellowship with Paul only and, and uh, Apollos only. But yeah, get over that thinking. If you took some time travel and went back to this time, Paul might probably, is might probably, can you put that together in a sentence? I don't know if that forms a complete sentence or not. Paul would probably be my favorite preacher. You know where I would slip? If I say I am of Paul, you get your you get your favorite preachers, your favorite authors, your favorite commentaries. Everybody does. But when you say I am of Matthew Henry, I am of Charles Spurgeon, I am of Billy Sunday, I am of Harry Ironside, I am of we're off. You live your life in christ learn from teachers preachers authors but you got to be careful of the subtle division we've had this happen trying to warn us all this evening 
we first got started and we had a, a family come and they were giving me traction literature on this same preacher. And secretly, I had figured this out just by it playing out. I had no idea what was going on until it went on. <laughs> but they were really just coming and listening to see if I lined up with their favorite preacher. That's the problem that they're having in the Corinthian church. That's the problem why they're divided with the Lord's Supper. They're all thinking of themselves. And it is wrong to go into a church and listen to the preacher with that motive. you got to line every single preacher up with the word of God. And if he says something that doesn't line up with the word of God, throw it out. We just need to be careful about throwing the preacher out the first mistake because Paul isn't throwing these people out. He's trying to help them. He's trying to help them. Instead of being quick to divide, let's be quick to unite and see if we can work the problem out. <laughs> no loving mother, no loving father sees their children make the mistake and make the mistake again and create a pattern of those mistakes. And then at the end of the month says, get out. No loving parent does that. They have to work through the tough times. Now, if you're 32 and still living at home, well, that's a different story. I'm talking about, you know, young, young. Now, isn't this just like Paul? Look at, look at verse 18. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And then he says, and I partly believe it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. It's really the character and the charity of Paul in that, in that statement. He says in verse number 5, uh, yeah, let's start with verse number 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh, seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Paul says, I partly believe it. There's a part of me that believes you. <laughs> he said, he's already confronted them. Emotions are already high, but I can't help but go back to the beginning of the chapter when he says, I praise you. It's like Paul, under the Holy Spirit's inspiration, is deliberately trying to find some good things that they're doing. It's like he's trying to find a reason to praise them. You know, if you're parenting and you expect your kids not to mess up, it's probably unrealistic. All children mess up. All parents mess up. All spouses mess up. It might be a good idea to try to find some things to praise them for <laughs> in the midst of a correction. I think it's called the sandwich approach. You sandwich the correction with a praise for something instead of, your room's a mess. The bathroom's a mess. You got clothes all over the place. You didn't mow the grass. In the living room, you got toys all over the place. Now get it all fixed. Now all that might need to get fixed and all that might need to be said. But you might want to say before that, now I praise you. You actually got up on time this morning. Paul found something to praise them for before before he got to I praise you not it's like chitter chatter in church sometimes you have to say look I praise you for coming to church I praise you for sitting up straight at church but I praise you not for chitter chatter when the preacher's talking you sit up and you listen quietly that what, that's what Paul's doing. That's an example of what Paul's doing. He found something to praise them for because he's getting ready to say, hey, quit the chitter chatter. The word of God's being preached. But notice Paul didn't leave. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number one. He's got divisions and he's sticking in there. He's staying in there. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number one. 
Look at verse number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number twi uh, 10. <laughs> Twin. <laughs> now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, in that ideal, there's no divisions. Everybody's just perfectly joined together and the work of Christ goes on. I'm telling you, that is what we should be striving together for. You get a hold of a new doctrine that you see in the Bible. You get a hold of a new truth that you see in the Bible. Be careful that you just don't run over somebody like a bulldozer who's just trying to, they're just trying to hold together what they do know. They're not where you are yet. Try to find a way to get them to perfectly fit in there. Give them room to grow like the Lord gave you room to grow. It's not the expense of truth. It's just having some charity like Paul had. Paul didn't get puffed up, but he doesn't. The Lord Jesus Christ does not want us to be divided. And then he says in verse number 11 of 1 Corinthians, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So I don't know what's happened at Chloe's house. <laughs> but there's something happened at Chloe's house where the truth came out. And there are divisions. Paul's trying to help them out. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Verse number 3. For ye are yet carnal. For, at, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Now everybody should know. Everybody should know that a Christian should not walk carnally. Where do the divisions come from? Carnal living. May I say this? There is no such thing as a carnal Christian. It doesn't fit. It's wrong. It might happen. Somebody might be saved and living carnally, but it, it shouldn't be your ideal, your end goal. You are called to live a set apart, a holy life. You're sanctified. You're set apart to live for Christ, not for yourself. Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, the Bible says in verse number 23. Ephesians 5 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. You know how we can get rid of divisions? If we realize that it's Christ's body. If we can get a hold of that. We'll stop thinking carnally. We'll, start, we'll stop thinking about ourselves. He says, I hear that there be divisions among you in 1 Corinthians. I'm going to give you a couple of possible reasons why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the 18th verse, why he says, I hear that there be divisions among you. If you love power and you love popularity, there'll be divisions. The more power you have, the more you are able to control the circumstances. This is what bosses and CEOs and governments and big organizations want. They ultimately want to control the circumstance. And if you have control of the circumstance, that allows you to control the outcome. And people that are power hungry, I'm telling you, there are going to be divisions with them. Each and every one of us would be good to know Lord doesn't want us to have divisions. He doesn't want us to be power hungry. He wants us to be hungry for the word of God. He wants us to be fed the word of God. We already talked about this. Problems arise from, I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas. And we should all be saying, I am of, I am of Christ. Very good. We sometimes set ourselves up for divisions. The more creeds we have, the more uh, uh, church covenants we have, the more of these man-made documents that we have, the more confessions we have, it gives us more opportunity to divide. Instead, we should just say, here's my covenant. 
Here's my creed. Here's my confession. This is what we stand on. I don't need a 15 page pamphlet to give somebody with a confession, or an article or creed. I can just say, here's what the Bible says. That helps us to be focused on the word of God. Now, look, we, we do it. We do it with tracks. We do it with print. I'm not saying we don't have print. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is we need to be careful. We need to be careful that we don't move from the word of God. When we do that, we're going to have division. The last reason I would give to you that uh, another reason why divisions happen is people have a zeal of God, but it's not according to knowledge. You ever been really excited about something and you find out, well, wait a minute, I shouldn't have been excited about that. It's a zeal, but not according to knowledge. As we close, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 deals with mainly authority, headship. We talked about all of that in many sermons. Men say, well, what, men, men say, well, what's wrong with having long hair? Women say, well, what's wrong with having uh short hair and we should it should be it, that implies that we are the authority the questions we ask reveal who our authority is if the three-year-old or the four-year-old runs the home who is the authority well why can't i do this well why can't i why do this and the Who's the authority? The parents should be saying, hey, this is the way we're going to do it. We need to be more concerned with the Lord getting glory than we are concerned with us getting glory. That's the cause of the division. That's the root cause. We seek to defend who we are. We seek to defend what we think. We seek to defend what our conclusion is. Instead of, hey, what does the word of God say? And I'm willing and ready to change it. Not ask questions that reveal that I really want to be the authority. We hear something in the word of God and it's always, well, why? Doesn't that really mean? And it's very clear what it means. You just have to read the words and understand English. And it's very clear what it means. But we ask those questions because we want to get the glory. We don't want the word of God to convict us. We need to be careful of that. That's going to cause division. Lastly, we'll close with this. Get John 13, verse number eight. Peter saith unto him, thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Now, we're not going to get into foot washing. Okay, so don't get, don't get nervous. <laughs> Jesus told Peter, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. To avoid division, you need to be washed by Christ. You need to have the washing of Jesus Christ and have your sins forgiven. <laughs> That's what he's telling Peter. Now watch. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He's asking for more. And that's what we ought to do. We read something in the word of God. We come together. Instead of thinking of ways to divide, Lord, wash me more. Wash my hands. Wash my head. Wash my feet. I need your washing, Lord. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, said he, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done? To you. you call me master and lord and you say well for so am i jesus he is spending time serving sinners he is the lord and he's getting down and washing feet we all need to be washed by christ and if you're washed by christ you're made completely whole and completely clean and he wants you to gather together and assemble together and serve. And you know how you can serve best? I'm not telling you to wash somebody's feet. What I'm telling you is you get as low as you can go and do the dirtiest job you can find and serve another sinner and you'd be less likely to divide over petty things. 
you'd be less likely to mess up the Lord's Supper.